Chapter thirty three, part four of A Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter thirty three, The Last Jacobite Rising, part four. A great mistake was made next day if Loch Gary, who commanded the Macdonalds of Glengarry, and Maxwell of Kirkconnell are correct in saying that Lord George insisted on placing his Athol men on the right wing. The Macdonalds had an old claim to the right wing, but as far as research enlightens us, their failure on this fatal day was not due to jealous anger. The battle might have been avoided, but to retreat was to lose Inverness and all chance of supplies. On the highland right was the water of Narn, and they were guarded by a wall which the Campbells pulled down, enabling Cumberland's cavalry to take them in flank. Cumberland had about nine thousand men, including the Campbells. Charles, according to his muster-master, had five thousand. Of horse he had but a handful. The battle began with an artillery duel, during which the clans lost heavily, while their few guns were useless, and their right flank was exposed by the breaking down of the protecting wall. After some unexplained and dangerous delay, Lord George gave the word to charge, in face of a blinding tempest of sleet, and himself went in, as did Lochiel, claymore in hand. But though the order was conveyed by Kerr of Graydon first to the Macdonalds on the left, as they had to charge over a wider space of ground, the Camerons, Clan Chatton, and Maclean's came first to the shock. Nothing could be more desperate than their attack, or more properly received, says Whiteford. The assailants were infilleted by Wolfe's regiment, which moved up and took position at right angles, like the fifty-second on the flank of the last charge of the French guard at Waterloo. The Highland right broke through Barrel's regiment, swept over the guns, and died on the bayonets of the second line. They had thrown down their muskets after one fire, and, says Cumberland, stood and threw stones for at least a minute or two before their total rout began. Probably the fall of Lochiel, who was wounded and carried out of action, determined the flight. Meanwhile the left, the Macdonalds, menaced on the flank by cavalry, were plied at a hundred yards by grape. They saw their leaders, the gallant Keppoch and Macdonald of Scothouse, with many others, fall under the grape-shot. They saw the right wing broken, and they did not come to the shock. If we may believe four sworn witnesses in a court of justice, July twenty fourth, seventeen fifty two, whose testimony was accepted as the basis of a judicial discreet, January tenth, seventeen fifty six, Keppoch was wounded while giving his orders to some of his men not to outrun the line in advancing, and was shot dead as a friend was supporting him. When all retreated, they passed the dead body of Keppoch. The tradition constantly given in various forms that Keppoch charged alone deserted by the children of his clan, is worthless if sworn evidence may be trusted. As for the unhappy Charles, by the evidence of Sir Robert Strange, who was with him, he had ridden along the line to the right, animating the soldiers, and endeavouring to rally the soldiers who, annoyed by the enemy's fire, were beginning to quit the field. He was got off the field when the men in general were betaking themselves precipitately to flight, nor was there any possibility of their being rallied. York, an English officer, says that the prince did not leave the field till after the retreat of the second line. So far the prince's conduct was honourable and worthy of his name. But presently, on the advice of his Irish entourage, Sullivan and Sheridan, who always suggested suspicions, and doubtless not forgetting the great price on his head, he took his own way towards the west coast in place of joining Lord George and the remnant with him at Ruthven and Badenoch. On April 26 he sailed from Borodale in a boat, and began that course of wanderings and hair-breadth escapes, in which only the loyalty of Highland hearts enabled him, at last, to escape the ships that watched the isles, and troops that netted the hills. Some years later General Wolfe, when residing at Inverness, reviewed the occurrences, and made up his mind that the battle had been a dangerous risk for Cumberland, while the pursuit, though ruthlessly cruel, was inefficient. Despite Cumberland's insistent orders to give no quarter, orders justified by the absolutely false pretext that Prince Charles had set the example, Lotgarry reported that the army had not lost more than a thousand men. Fire and sword and torture, the destruction of tilled lands, and even of the shellfish on the shore, did not break the spirit of the Highlanders. Many bands held out in arms, and Lotgarry was only prevented by the Prince's command from laying an ambush for Cumberland. The Campbells and the Macleods under the recreant chief, the Whig Macdonalds under Sir Alexander of Sleet, ravaged the lands of the Jacobite clansmen, but the spies of Abermarle, who now commanded in Scotland, reported the Macleans, 
the Grants of Glenmoriston, with the Macphersons, Glengarry's men, and Lochiel's Camerons, as all eager to do it again, if France would only help. But France was helpless, and when Lochiel sailed for France with the prince, only Cluny remained, hunted like a partridge in the mountains, to keep up the spirit of the cause. Old Lovett met a long-deserved death by the executioner's axe, though it needed the evidence of Murray of Broughton, turned informer, to convict that fox. Kilmarnock and Balmerino were also executed. The good and brave Duke of Perth died on his way to France. The aged Tilliburdine in the tower. Many gallant gentlemen were hanged. Lord George escaped, and is the ancestor of the present Duke of Athol. Many gentlemen took French service. Others fought in other alien armies. Three or four in the highlands or abroad took the wages of spies upon the prince. The thirty thousand pounds of French gold, buried near Loch Arcaig, caused endless feuds, kinsmen denouncing kinsmen. The secrets of the years 1746 to 1760 are to be sought in the Cumberland and Stuart manuscripts in Windsor Castle and the Record Office. Legislation intended to scotch the snake of Jacobitism began with religious persecution. The Episcopalian clergy had no reason to love triumphant Presbyterianism, and actively or in sympathy were favorers of the exiled dynasty. Episcopalian chapels, sometimes mere rooms in private houses, were burned, or their humble furniture was destroyed. All Episcopalian ministers were bidden to take the oath and pray for King George by September 1746, or suffer for the second offense, transportation for life to the American colonies. Later the orders conferred by Scottish bishops were of made of no avail. Only with great difficulty and danger could parents obtain the right of baptism for their children. Very little is said in our histories about the sufferings of the Episcopalians, when it was their turn to be under the harrow. They were not violent. They murdered no moderator of the General Assembly. Other measures were the Disarming Act, the prohibition to wear the Highland dress, and the abolition of hereditable jurisdictions, and the chief's right to call out his clansmen in arms. Compensation in money was paid, from twenty-one thousand pounds to the Duke of Argyle, to thirteen pounds, six shillings, eight pence, to the clerks of the register of Aberbrothock. The whole sum was one hundred and fifty-two thousand, two hundred thirty-seven pounds, fifteen shillings, four pence. In 1754 an act annexed the forfeited estates of the Jacobites, who had been out, or many of them, inalienably to the crown. The estates were restored in 1784. Meanwhile, the profits were to be used for the improvement of the highlands. If submissive tenants received better terms and larger leases than of old, Jacobite tenants were evicted for not being punctual with rent. Therefore, on May 14, 1752, some person unknown shot Campbell of Glenure, who was about evicting tenants on the lands of Lochiel and Stuart of Ardshiel and Appen. Campbell rode down from Fort William to Balachulish Ferry, and when he had crossed it said, I am safe now I am out of my mother's country. But as he drove along the old road through the woods of Lettermore, perhaps a mile and a half south of Balachulish House, the fatal shot was fired. For this crime James Stewart of the Glens was tried by a Campbell jury at Inverary, with the Duke on the bench, and was of course convicted, and hanged on the top of a knoll of Balachulish Ferry. James was innocent, but Alan Breck Stewart was certainly an accomplice of the man with the gun, which, by the way, was the property neither of James Stewart nor of Stewart of Fannis Clark. The murderer was anxious to save James by avowing the deed, but his kinsfolk, saying, They will only hang both James and you, bound him hand and foot and locked him up in the kitchen on the day of James's execution. Alan lay for some weeks at the house of a kinsman in Rannoch, and escaped to France, where he had a fight with James Moore MacGregor, then a spy in the service of the Duke of Newcastle. The murder of the Red Fox caused all the more excitement, and is all the better remembered in Lochaber and Glencoe, because agrarian violence and revenge for eviction has scarcely another example in the history of the Highlands. End of chapter 33 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org